Welcome to episode four in series two of LD's Pivot to Performance. In this series, Guy Wallace and myself, David James, will be speaking with esteemed guests about their own pivot from learning focused practice towards a performance orientation that more predictably and reliably, let alone efficiently and successfully, achieves demonstrable results for both employees and organizations. For the five conversations we have scheduled in this series, we've invited guests that have made the pivot themselves and have achieved real results from doing so. We'll invite our guests to share their stories, we'll question them on their approaches and encourage them to share relatable experiences to inspire you to either initiate or enhance your own pivot. We'll also seek plenty of opportunities for you to get involved too. So let's start with our own introductions, um, uh, including our own pivot from a learning focus to performance focus. So I'll kick us off. As I mentioned, I'm David James. I'm uh, nearly 25 years in learning and development, uh, perhaps notab most notably uh, as Director of Learning, Talent and Organisational Development for, you, uh, for uh, Disney uh, in Europe, Middle East and Africa. And whilst I spent the first half of that, of that, that time, um, about seven or eight years um, in learning and development in, as, uh, in the classroom, uh, as a trainer, really honing my skills in, uh, first of all, delivery, then design, uh, then analysis and evaluation, uh, I felt that the conversations I was having once I joined Disney were fundamentally different. And instead of being asked for courses, of course, I was asked for some. Uh, more often than not, I was asked for actual change. Uh, and I realized that, uh, that the time spent in the classroom wasn't perhaps the best apprenticeship for what I was uh, experiencing then at Disney. So I, my pivot came pretty quickly uh, and I lent heavily on mini accelerated apprenticeships rather than uh, training programs and certainly not e-learning. Uh, during that period. Uh, but where my passion really lies now is applying uh, a performance orientation to digital um, because um, I, I think that, that, that digital uh, learning solutions are notorious for low engagement and there's a big clue why. Uh, and that's probably why you're here is because they don't aim to actually affect performance. Uh, they're created uh, without performance in mind and we rely far too much on sorcery and hope uh, for that to actually uh, make any difference. And so, uh, so it's very much my mission to, uh, to, to change the way we think about that. Uh, Guy, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, certainly. Thank you, David. So my name is Guy Wallace. I've been in this business since 1979, and I'm one of the lucky few. It, we're rare, but there are a number of us who are oriented to performance from the get-go, from day one. And I was introduced to the thinking and the writings uh, of people like the late Gary Rumler, Tom Gilbert, Joe Harless, and Bob Mager. Those were my first four major influences. I was given articles and books that they had written and uh, workshop materials uh, that my colleagues had uh, participated in and had the copies and gave them to me. And so I was very lucky in that and I spent a lot of time in my first few years looking at the way other people approached what we used to call instruction or training, and nowadays it's learning. But a lot of that was focused on topics or on behaviors and didn't really go that last mile, so to speak, to show people how to apply those in their what we call nowadays workflow, but it was forever called processes or in the quality movement work streams. Uh, we have a lot of competing language, a lot of messy language in our business. But so I got oriented to that uh, very early on, on day one and was reinforced uh, primarily through my association with uh, the NSPI, the National Society for Performance Improvement, which is nowadays the International Society for Performance Improvement, which is where I met our guest today, Dr. Judith Hale. Now, forever I've called her Judy. We were joking about this before we started. Uh, so uh, Judy Hale is somebody that I met when I moved from Saginaw, Michigan, and my first job to Motorola at my second job in the suburbs of Chicago. And she and I met at the Chicago NSPI chapter meetings. So I've known her for a long time. I've been a big fan of hers for a long time. And uh, she is one of the people in our field who really speaks a, a performance orientation. Um, and so, uh, Judy, thanks so much for agreeing to join us today on this. Uh, 
for our audience, could you please give them a little bit about your background as it relates to performance and to learning and development? Certainly, uh, it's really, it's a pleasure being here and working with all of you and getting to know the people from Ghana. Oh my goodness. And we, it, it, we're in Austin, Texas, why not? Denver, this is great. Yeah, let, let's start out by saying that I didn't come into this world through the typical path. Okay, I came, my, my degrees are in communication, my master's in theater management. So I taught, I was the dreaded speech teacher for seven years. So I, when you do that and you teach people to do extemporaneous speaking, the thing is, what is it you want that listener to do, think, or feel from this exchange? You always start there. What do I, what do I want this person to think about me? What do I want them to do? What do I want them to feel about this experience? If you don't do that, it's all noise coming out of your mouth, right? So, and it also forces you to think about who that listener is. So you, you don't come in with a, prescribed listener or something like that. <clears throat> well, anyway, um, I was tenured, but I was bored. And so I quit. And I actually, then I had this little interim time where I went to work for a professional association where, which did performance-based testing and a certification. And it, it was fascinating to me moving from the classic speech into how do we know people can do their work? How do we know people can do the work? And in this case, they were given uh, complex case studies. They were actually asked to go out and do the work. There was no such thing as a controlled test, cheating. No, it, it was done on the job. How you really do it, which was a great orientation for me. Uh, in that time, because I was bored, I started listening to different things and exposing myself to different things. And I read about value engineering. And this is where you talk about, they, they start with why even have the problem. So they're into the, what we call today root cause analysis, but they didn't call it that. They said, what's the, why don't you attack the problem? Why, why, what's causing the problem? Why, stop, why solve a, a symptom down here where you can just eliminate the problem? Well, that's an interesting kind of thought about all of that. So, so that was, anyway, in this exploration, I stumbled, I now started my own, uh, by the way, I wrote a letter to seven companies in Chicago, one page letter with a typographical error in it, by the way, saying I had an observation and five of them called me up and hired me. And this was a result of Hale Associates. That started it. My son's question was, mom, will we still eat? And I said, yes. I said, he said, go for it. And with that, that was gave birth to my company. And I uh, now was, so so this is all this learning exploration for me. This, there was no such thing as, this is all about learning. This is all about Judy not being bored. Please understand. And so I got to, I got introduced to and took on some major assignments. And this is where the theater and the communication started coming together. I found out my clients were not skilled at articulating what their needs were. I found out that uh, they were not really skilled at working with each other. I found out that what we were working on was the wrong stuff. I found out that they all talk like they meant the same thing, but when you probe, they all meant different things. So they used the same words, but it all had different meaning for them. So this is my coming, how I got into this. And then I actually, because I, I attended, by now I'm uh, a member of the Industrial Relations Research Association, which is where lawyers came together and union organizers came together and labor, um, uh, well, uh, OSHA was there, uh, government agencies were together. And I laughed because that's where they, where they would leave their guns at the door and they would come into these meetings because all day long they fought. And so, but when they came to the door, you could only be a member as an individual. You could not be a member through your company. So, and, and literally they would fight all day and they would come to these meetings and they would then work toward a shared goal of how do we build uh, relations with labor between labor and management? How do we build uh, workplace safety? How do we really work together? So that was the only time 
They were allowed to be neutral. They were allowed to work toward a common goal because when they went out, they had their vested interest and they had to fight. It was fascinating learning. Well, then I've discovered in SPI the chapter, Chicago chapter. And this was also late 79 guy. And I went to, without a doubt, the worst meeting anyone could ever have on this earth. And I decided it had to be an anomaly because no organization could survive and be that bad. So I came back and sure enough, it was an anomaly. And then I, st that's when I started meeting other people and looking at this in new ways. And, and it was just a fascinating kind of merging, I'll call it of forces. Is that enough of me? <laughs> well, yes. Thank you so much for that. So uh, in that, you've already talked a little bit about your personal pivot and how you've made that pivot to performance. Um, so let me let me shift to our next question, which is uh, we're, we're looking for a highlight here about your approach to analysis. And then I'd like to circle back after you give us an, uh, the big picture view of how you conduct analysis or what others might call discovery, just so we're clear about the, the those two terms. Um, and and we'll come back and, and probe a little bit deeper about the specifics of your approach to analysis when you begin to engage clients. But but can you give us an overview of your approach to analysis? Well, my approach to analysis is, first of all, it begins the first time of contact, not when the contract signed. Because in that window, when they first contact you to the contract, they actually are more revealing. They don't self-censor as much because they don't think it's serious. You know? They're out fighting about you not realizing that you're finding out about them. And so I, I find that, so I really do the first point of contact is when the analysis begins, because I am listening then for hidden agendas. I'm listening for their ability to articulate the problem. I'm listening now for, are they, what are they really focused on? Are they looking at the whole total environment or is this all about Harry? We just take care of Harry, the world will get better. Uh, I, I want to know how ingrained they are in what they're about. I'm also going to find out this time, are they in dispute? Uh, are there power clicks or there something like that? So the point is, right from the very beginning, people, the guard is down because they're here to find out if I'm any good. And so they reveal a tremendous amount about their biases, their assumptions, their openness to whole bunch of things and things like that. So that's the first thing. The second thing um, uh, is that, let's say the contract sign. okay? Now I am, I instead of coming and tell them what I'm going to do, I then will sit down and say, now tell me about how you got here. What, 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 why am I in this room? How did you get here? Because I want to know how well they thought through their history, uh, what triggered them, and what have you, because I'm not coming in saying I have the solution in my hip pocket. I'm insisting that they do that. Okay. Uh, I, I pay a lot of attention to the physical environment, which is now more difficult that we're on. Um, it's all virtual, but even there, they disclose some interesting things. So I, uh, I am interested in the physical environment, partially because I'm deaf. So I will go into an office and the ambient noise, I don't know how anybody could think. And they talk about airs. You know, if they get a, if they got a good acoustical engineer, they do a whole lot. You don't need training. And so, or I'll go into places where the air is so stale and they don't understand that if you have poor quality air, your brain doesn't work. So let's, let's talk about that. Uh, I'll walk into places where people feel unsafe. And if you feel unsafe, why can you concentrate on being? So I, I uh, maybe that's my theater background because you have to create the environment for the story and things like that. But I, I really do, very beginning, I pay attention to the physical environment where people are being asked to work. I pay attention to uh, the degree to which they are open. So now you're talking about my process. Next thing I get them to agree on something. Okay. So I, I do the classic sales. Yes, 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 yes. So you we're all in agreement that the, what we want to have happen here is this. 
and yes, okay. Now, and, and we agree that this didn't work. So I walk them through some questions. That I know that their answers will be yes, because nobody's stupid enough to say no. So you give them the yes, 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 yes. And then I get down to negotiating. You say, now, okay, now that we've agreed on that, are you open to some new ideas or another way of looking at it? That immediately tells me if they're not open to that, I'm in the wrong room. So uh, I negotiate for that crack, that door, that, and that's where we're going to go and explore question. You call it validate fact finding discovery, but that's already been happening. But now I'm going to negotiate how open are they to some new ideas, new perspectives. Um, over the years, I have learned that people are terrible writers, but they're great editors. And I don't have any ego here. So I will, I will give them some, I might come in with hip pocket pieces of paper. Like, did you know the research says these are the 10 most common mistakes that organizations make? And, and I had one executive look at me and said, we've made all 10 of them. I said, okay, that's good. You're not, now we can move on. <laughs> Why keep making mistakes? So uh, anyway, if they can be editors, they feel empowered. They can criticize me. I'm not so perfect. They can do that. In the process, they're, they're telling me again, they're revealing their assumptive base, what they really know, uh, how open they are. They are disclosing a great deal of information, which for me, I need to know how to position my recommendations going forward. And those recommendations might be to do some actual validation of data, confirming. It might be asking to actually observe someone at task to look at what's really going on. Maybe it's uh, finding out. You, I always say when you ask the people who do the work, you find out what they do. And if you ask the people who rely on the work, you find out what they should do. So I try to find out both of those kinds of things. Is this the information you guys are looking for? Yes, thank you. So can you get a little bit more specific when you talk about uh, where you observe people and you talk to the people that are the recipients of the work? What kinds of focus do you have on the what we might call performance? How would you uh, describe performance or define performance if you're going to have that kind of a focus for our audience? Because if they want to take away from you and your lessons here, they can talk to the people that do the work. They can talk to the people who receive the work. But what what might you be looking at specifically and defining for them so that you can you know get confirmation or denial about what you've captured? Well, I'll give you these are two kind of related examples. Okay, uh, one I was brought in because they wanted me to teach nurses how to be nice. Okay, well, I happen to believe nurses are nice. Okay, but anyway, but I said, fine, you know, I don't, this is a true case. I can't make this up. Okay, well, once you teach nurses to be nice, and I, my point is, and I started, so what does nice look like? I mean, uh, what does nice look like when the patient is biting you? What does nice look like when the patient is saying horrible things about your ancestry and your heritage? What, ha what does nice look like when they spit on you? Tell me just what does nice look like? And out of that, we discovered what we needed, in fact, were protocols of when the nurses are being abused, that you can call security, they can, because the nurse's job is, in this case, was to put in IVs, get vitals, and things like that. And you try doing that when someone's spitting on you, biting you. And so what does nice look like? And yet your, your doctor is saying, how come I, I need this? I need this. I need this. So the job is pushing you to perform. <clears throat> and that performance was assuming a cooperative patient, you know, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So uh, that was one of my real cases. So I start out by saying, so what does it look like? You know, what does nice look like? And then giving them circumstances so I find out, so negotiating, there was no training needed here, okay? But what we did do, we needed to come up with agreement on some protocols. When was it all right for the nurse to scream for help 
<clears throat> and or and when was it all right for security or somebody to come in and help with that? Because no one should have to go through that level of abuse to do their job. Another kind of related real example was I was hired to teach executives to be nice. Now, again, if you're listening, I can't make this up. OK, so the the executive to be nice. Well, again, we both know that's a stupid, but OK, they wanted it and they wanted um, it would be mandated training. They were going to require the executives to go to this. So apparently some executive ticked somebody off. That's all I can tell you, right? What was going on? And in this case, uh, what I did is I knew that something else was seriously broken. And this was a, this was a bad band-aid. I can imagine like, it's like <clears throat> requiring an executive to go to a webinar. You know what they're going to do? They're going to answer the email. They're going to do a, you know, they're going to be in person, but they're not going to really be engaged or anything like that. Um, so I, I went around and again, comes back to, so when they're nice, okay, now they're trained and they're nice. What's going to be different? How, how, why, how will you know what's going to be different in this company that tells you executives are nice? Because that's my scorecard. That's what you're really asking. You're asking me to solve that other problem. So tell me what that is. So again, I come in with some agreement and getting like that. Well, I said, would it be, oh, I'm negotiating. Could I ch check some stuff out? Because, you know, this is very important training. If you're going to bring executives in, I have to, it has to be hot. Dang. Right. That's one of my favorite words. Okay. So you have to, you have to do really a hot dang job on this. So I don't want to waste your time. I don't want to waste your money, you know, and I'm expensive. So would you, is it okay that I get some information so that we really don't wait? Oh yeah. So they open the door <clears throat> and I found out, there were numerous, they had the proportion of their employees getting counseling on therapy was off the charts. Okay. I talked to their uh, medical director and found out their premiums were going up because they had so many people in, in, in with claims, health claims. So I thought, this is off the chart. Okay. So this is a sick company. Okay. Then I, I went to, um, I talked to someone in operations and I found out, this is a manufacturing, that they had a lot of people not showing up. Well, you know, manufacturing, absenteeism kills you if you're on a production line. So people don't show up, okay? Or they're late, right? Or they're bickering. Okay, so okay, there's fighting, fighting everywhere, something like that. And um, so I was suddenly getting the scorecard, if you will, that if they are nice, we expect health claims to go down, we expect uh, less absenteeism, less tardyism, right? Is that what we're talking about? So like that. Well, then, um, again, my process, you have to understand, which I didn't articulate, maybe I should. My goal, one of my processes is to get the client to remove their blinders, <clears throat> to become more aware of the larger picture. So I asked if I could uh, convene a small group six of the target audience who's going to come to this webinar. And could I have them meet together? And, uh, and I did a focus group. I did a nominal group and things like that. And this is where I discovered that they're never allowed to turn their cell phones off. They're never allowed. If, you were at the, if you're at the opera, the cell phone's on. You know, if you're at your child's rehearsal, the cell phone's on. I even had one tell me who's in a medical examination and his cell phone was on. He had to take the call. You must, you're never allowed to not take a call. Well, this is actually an abusive environment. Okay. And, and what's the incentive for these executives to be nice? This is actually bullying behavior. So uh, now, uh, now those of you who are inside, I want to share something with you. You be careful because you can't do this. This will get you in trouble. But what I did is I set the president and some of the other people. And I said, who's the asshole in the room? Now, so one of my things is if I can't be direct, if I have to, if I have to tiptoe, that's important information. I'm very skilled at tiptoeing. I can know how to do that. But that tells me the real ability to, to, to validate the issue 
and get real good information is harder to get because everyone's obfuscating. You know, everyone's playing the role. Everyone's pretending everything's fine. And, and that's called drama. Remember the theater, we're all creating this illusion. So you want to see behind the scenes, something like that. And I found out I, in this particular case, we did have a senior executive who was <clears throat> creating chaos so he could steal. He was involved in some ugly, very ugly behavior. So in the end, they said, we still need our training because we have a budget. So I actually produced a 45 minute video and where I presented them information of the consequences of, of uh, the medical cost consequences. Uh, as executives, I told them the consequences uh, on the production with, with tardyism and absenteeism. So I just gave them the, the webinar really said, here's the state of the art. And then I asked them, and what are you going to do? To, you know, what are you going to do when one of you steps out of line, and goes back to old behavior? Not what Judy's going to do. Not what HR is going to do. Not what training is going to do. What are you going to do when one of your peers goes back to old behavior that you don't want? That was the question. Because this that's how it works. I mean, did you get anything out of that that would help you going forward? I mean. I, I think so. David, do we have any uh, questions or comments from our, our participants? Yeah, yeah, I've got some uh, some questions, Judy. First of all, we had the, it's hugely insightful, uh, and and perhaps I'll I'll start with uh, with the, with the third one on here rather than the uh, have these in chronological order. Um, uh, Judy, I know um, many in L and D will struggle with the confidence to challenge stakeholders. Um, we we are um, criticised sometimes for being order takers. Uh, what you've just described there with a couple of examples one with uh, with the nurses um you know um you know you gave the examples uh how how to tell me how show me how a, a nurse is nice in these circumstances and that last one um who's the arsehole in the room um <laughs> like how 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 did you develop your confidence to ask these more challenging questions and what advice would you give to somebody who's more nervous now because they're much more used to taking the orders? Well, first of all, first of all, stop being embarrassed about taking orders. It's okay to take orders, okay? Mm. So, and in the process of taking the order, those are you have little opportunities to plant seeds, to build your customers, your internal clients' awareness of what's going on. So you you can you can you can do the order taking you can do this but do it well, hmm. do it well don't do slop do it well. Next and in that process say it was always thank them for the opportunity to partner and collaborate with them. Oh by the way, if I could ever help you in other things, let me know. Okay and and uh, drop little. I I'm a big believer in creating dissonance, David. Now, what I mean by that is that this is an opportunity to say, oh, by the way, you know, other organizations have found this helpful if they also give people support tools on the job. Mm. Oh, by the way, you know, I found that we, are, I, you know, I just discovered that everyone thinks that they know we're all talking about the same thing only to find out they're not. It's amazing how we use the same words to be different things. Do you really know? So I, I use all those opportunities to plant seeds to help my client get more aware that maybe there's more going on than we realize. Mm -hmm. Like maybe a performance support tool would really be helpful. Like maybe, or when I develop training, I almost always look for opportunities that take to the job, use that to create tools that transfer there. That gives me a chance to ask how to make it useful on the job. So I've had job aids where um, people wear uniforms and they have breast pockets. So my job aids are always have to fit in the pocket. Hmm. So I, so anyway, don't be ashamed of, 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 of taking orders, to, but just make sure that when you take the order, you do an exquisite job and you look for opportunities in doing that to add other solution sets perform a support tool negotiate clarity of instruction 
call to questions or people really getting what the, the information that you think that they're getting. Um, so anyway, the, the, we have, uh, I'm trying not to read the chat, but it's coming here. Go ahead, David. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks, Judy. So, so what I'm, what I'm, I'm hearing as well with, uh, within that, that you've not stated uh, explicitly, Judy, is that you play the long game, you, you, you work on the relationship and you incrementally uh, build currency with your stakeholders by by uh, offering more value than you're asked for. Absolutely. Absolutely. By the way, as an external consultant, you should know one of the most dangerous engagements I can get is that I, I can a new guy is hired and he brings in Judy. This is a very dangerous relationship because the new guy doesn't have the political equity required. So if I'm working with that new guy, I need to negotiate to have someone on the team who does have political equity, high credibility within the stakeholders. Is that anything else, Dave? Yeah. Yeah, no, no, that's it. That's great. Thanks, Judy. So so we've got the question from Liz that's come in. Um, and she's asked, um, what's a good approach to make the new expected behavior sustainable? three to six months down the line to still keep doing things right? Well, first of all, we know what's required for sustainability. We know that we need consistent direction. We know we need accurate uh, information, uh, clear in a usable form. We know that we need to make sure that we reward and incent the right behaviors. So if I want it sustainable, I will drop those clues to my client and I'm say, oh, by the way, how are we doing? And I'll simply say, you know, to make things sustain, we need these things in place. Uh, are you now that's outside my are you working on that? Okay. So I can play dumb and and find out. So part of that is we need to leverage what we know. Clients don't always know what's sustainable. Let, let's talk about there's some research that one of the biggest problems, barriers to performance is the it, we think people have the information they need and they don't. They get what's on their desk. They get the email sent to them. They get what's in the manual, assuming the manual is even accessible uh, or it's up to date. And one of the biggest problems is the fact that information is incomplete, inaccurate, out of date, or in disagreement, conflicting. David, you look like you want to ask me a question. Go for it. No, no, no. I was just listening there, Judy. I've got uh, I've got more questions up my sleeve, but uh, but. Um... Uh, but no, I, I'm uh, I'm I'm just avidly listening uh, to uh, to what you're saying there. I can see Lizzie's uh, Lizzie's continuing to uh, to type. Maybe she's giving us some uh, some more specifics. Um, but uh, but no, I hope I didn't throw you off. Uh, oh, Liz has just uh, mentioned this is very insightful uh, and that she's taking notes. <laughs> Might be good. <laughs> It'd be a good point to hand over to you, guy, uh, to continue with uh, with the plan questions. See, my point is yes. I, I don't. I, I we just take orders. Wait a minute. Be a good order taker. Do it right. Hmm. But don't use, don't leverage those opportunities with your client to establish yourself as somebody who knows your stuff. You know, you know what's required for sustainability. This is not a secret. So raise the question. You say, oh, do it as I love these. Oh, by the way, if you see this article, oh my goodness, just the greatest thing. And and like like when I did that with this set of executives, I said, "Have you seen this? The ten common mistakes organizations like things don't just fascinating." And he looked at it and said, "We've done all 10. I said, "We well, get a prize." <laughs> so we we need to use those opportunities to build our credibility, to show that we have the larger view. Um. Again, as an outsider, uh, clients will call me in. I remind them that they were my door and the piece that I work with, but I'm really being paid by their company. So I'm going to be a steward of the company's money. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's great. Thanks, Judy. So, Judy, you've given us a couple of examples here of uh, uh, real-life projects that you've dealt with, but... Um, and if you do the intake, the request, if you do that well and understand that and you drop uh, uh, 
little bits of knowledge and insights for your clients to either inform them or to test their willingness to explore different things. What do you do when when you have a stakeholder that's really dug their heels and is assisting on training when you and the te- rest of the team can see that perhaps training, instruction, learning isn't going to solve their root cause? How? What are some of the things that you would suggest to our audience about uh, tact- strategies and tactics for them uh, when they're dealing with such a situation? <clears throat> well, uh, I go back to the research of Richard Bird and and because I've run into those situations. Well, first of all, just give them the training, okay? And But make sure it's helpful and not harmful. In other words, content, something like that. But the other thing is, you cannot, that person who might be a senior executive, well ensconced or something like that, they have made public promises. They've gone out and said, you know, I'm going to do training and I'm going to solve this. So they, so, so for them to back off is not a face. It, you have to be sensitive to what they have promised their peers or bosses or public or whoever. And they probably built themselves a hole. All right. So you have got to find, you have to be sensitive to that and showing them how to do that. The other thing is to call something training. It's not training. I mean, how, you know, it's training. All, it used to be a three ring binder. Okay, is training now uh, an eleven-minute video? Is training now? I mean, so part of this is we have to not be so rigorous ourselves. Is training we convene people? We put them on the room at safety, or put them on Zoom at the same time, or we, you know, or what is training? So I, I have no trouble lying to my clients. Okay, <laughs> now what I mean by that is I will, I will call something because it meets some political need, you know, does that help you? But I, I, so, all right. So if you have an executive like that, please understand that person's almost always gone out and made public statements. I know the problem. Harry can't do the job. We just train Harry. Everything would be done. Okay. They made some, and now for them, they don't have a face saving way to back pedal. They don't know how to, do that or something like that. Uh, When you can, the other thing is to get, engage that person's peers and get the peers to work and say, you know, I'm really glad you you solved this problem. You're doing other things too to help make sure it's sustainable, aren't you? So you can get peers to do some things. Now, I have, in fact, I had an executive make a request that was really, not wise and and he was very boisterous and it was very clear and he said I refuse to accept i do not if you can't dress this specifically don't even talk to me so he shut the door no dialogue nothing like that okay fine well i'm an outsider and i did something but those of you with good political clout inside can do i simply called his peers and i said look uh i know he's doing the best he he was sold a bill of goods. I'm willing to bet money. He went and met with a consultant. He said, I have a solution. It's, it's my box or my little, you know, three webinar or my 32, whatever. And I said, and I fear he's going to make a career damaging decision. And you as his peer, a trusted colleague or in a position to get him to maybe not give up, but at least open the door to other ideas. And I called three of this person's peers at home and and didn't ask to have a dialogue. Thank you very much, hung up. I mean, my conversation was 90 seconds at most. Okay? And I want you the next time I went with him, he says, you know, I've been thinking about this. Maybe we ought to consider some other things. So we, we are not the way to go. Sometimes we have to bring in peers and other people to do those kinds of things. How does what Judy's sharing relate to you and your L and D? Sorry, Judy, that's me encouraging questions. Don't you worry about me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so uh, Judy, it's uh, you, you've got a lot of experience doing this thing here. You, I mean, you've got uh, uh, a bunch of books out, and in particular, you have the 
performance consultants field book. I, I have both a first and second edition on the shelves behind me here. Um, and so where would you, what could you point people to and, and what advice can you give them now about how they can adapt uh, and adopt your approach to uh, you, uh, dealing with clients? Because what we've been talking about here is really kind of on the front end and, and dealing with the stakeholders, which is a critically important. Um, what, what advice do you have for them to build better relationships with their stakeholders before and during and after their engagements? Well, first of all, is do everything you can that you're never there to embarrass them. You're there to position them and uh, strengthen their position, uh, let their own peers know that they're very good. So uh, <clears throat> you never, ever publicly embarrass them or anything like that. Uh, next, you so you, you, when you present new insights, you can do it like it's an offhand latest research, just got that. And, and never ask anybody necessarily to engage with you. Let them engage with each other. So we tend to say that we want to be the center of the universe. No, we, we're, we're not the center of the universe. So they, they will then, and, and if they know you're not going to blab behind their back, they're going to maybe be more willing to disclose their discomfort, uh, their doubts, something like that. And then you can always negotiate. Well, would you like to explore that further? How do you think we could maybe double check that out? So, so again, uh, the language is not like, well, I know how to fix that. No, the, the language is more of a, how should we explore that? It's together, what have you. You can also ask, would you like me to, I mean, you're busy. You tell me how much you want to be involved. But how do I get a hold of you if I have a concern, if I have an insight? How would you like me to do that? So you can always negotiate your protocols for working with them, engaging them, communicating with them, something like that. I, I find that very helpful to do. Don't abuse the relationship. Don't suck time. Uh, anyway, that's... So in so in all of your your vast uh, writings and books and such, what what would you recommend to our audience uh, to, to get started uh, with a performance orientation so that they're they're not producing learning content that is peripheral or not directly affecting the performance in hand? Where what of all your resources might you point them to? Well, there's a lot of them, but you know, giving somebody a list of fifty is not very helpful. So, uh, you know, I, I mean, I started out under Jim Russell, Mike Melinda, okay, and his third partner. And, and their work is very good. It was all about instruction and well-designed instruction, well-designed messaging and things like that. And that to me is fundamental. You start that, you get, get to be good with that. And then, uh, Ruth Clark's work is excellent. You know, I mean, again, how do you position information so that people can actually comprehend it? They're not overwhelmed and things like that. So uh, th there are things that, you know, I don't know if I'm answering your question. But well, the, you, I mean, so you, you, of your books, what, what would you recommend uh, for somebody to start with in your own writings? Well, the book that people tell me they like the best is the field book, the performance consultants field book. That's the book that my publisher loves. That's the book that people like. It really talks about what this work is. It has some very good guidelines on how to do needs assessments, how to look at the larger picture. It's very prescriptive that way. And you can modify it. Uh, you can brand it your own. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, again, I really, the idea, you know, we, I love ISPI, but the idea that you have to go to a conference once a year to learn the business is very inefficient, you know, or you have to go get a master's degree. Well, that's great if you've got money and time, you know. 
So, so can we get something a little bit more focused here, something like that? So the field book really has some the questions and the guidelines for doing your needs assessment, your cause analysis, that upfront work. It doesn't tell you how to design solutions. You have to do a complete thought for that. But it does the upfront work really well. And it and hopefully tells you, tells you, you don't have to necessarily say, we have to do three months of needs assessment. No, no one's got three months. Come on, give me a break. But if you think about every contact, you're learning something. And you think about what is it you're trying to validate and confirm, it doesn't take that much time. You can do a whole lot in a week. Yeah, I think that if you're if you're really focused on performance, and again, that's why I wanted to kind of lead you to talking a little bit about your book, because I think it has guidance in that book to help people get started uh, with their focus and the pivot to performance from standard learning content on topics and all sorts of interesting things and pivoting to the performance specifics that you, your client is addressing, people need guidance in that. And I think that that's what you've, that's what I've learned from you over the decades here. And I wanted that to kind of come out. So the Performance Consultants Field Book is the name of the book. I've got the second edition. Are there are there newer editions from the second? I'm, going, I'm negotiating now for a third, but the second one still works. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, great. Uh, David, do we have any other questions or comments? Uh, yeah, we do. We have a, uh, another question from Liz that's been seconded by Jeanette. Um, and um, the question is, uh, how does the L&D professional change their own positioning and perception inside the company? So you've been talking and our questions have been about one specific stakeholder at a time. But but if, uh, if, uh, if perhaps if I'm interpreting this right, um, Liz, that uh, the, the overall positioning and perception inside the company of L&D, especially if L&D has difficulty improving its value. Well, I would tell you that get out of your own box, have, have coffee with more people. We tend to have coffee with the same people. We tend to have lunch with the same people. I would tell you to go out purposely to the line organization, you know, go have your coffee with them, go, go, go eat in their lunch room. Ask if you can sit in some meetings. Really make it a point to get to know your customer in their work world. Stop asking them to come to you and play by your rules. We, we actually build barriers. We're not, we might think we're open, we're not open at all. Well, if you want to fill out the 72 page form, answer these 32 questions, blah, blah, blah. Come on. I'll go hire somebody off the street. To get this. So you really need to show that you want to know them in their world and their environment and you respect that. So Great. I think those things and volunteer, volunteer. They're, they're, they're putting together a cross-functional team for the United Fund or the Christmas, whatever, who me, who me. Volunteer for those because you get to meet people as people and you get to overhear the conversations about what their concerns are. There's a huge amount of learning just in those opportunities. Great. Well, we've got a, a really important question here from Liz. Um, I could go so far as to say Liz has dropped a bomb here. Uh, so let's see if it goes off. Um, is it the job of L&D to focus on performance specifically or just to signal when learning isn't the solution and leave this performance issue to someone else? I think it has to do with your own structure. If you are in an organization where you have people who are in that quote performance space, maybe not making them enemies, but learning to collaborate with them would be helpful. But most organizations don't have it that way. So the so you as a learning organization, you want your learning to be successful. You must look at it in the eyes of performance. If you want to, if you want your teaching, people learn because you want them to behave different in a new way on the job. You want to behave safely more courteously, anyway, more efficiently. You are looking for that. If you want that sustainable, then you have to look at performance. What are the supports that keep that going? What's the constant rewards, incentives, uh, performance support tools, and making sure that we're in agreement. So when we teach someone performance, but the boss disagrees, wait a minute, we, we've got a breakdown right there. We need to get congruency within the organization. So I would tell you that it depends upon your structure, of course. But I would say our job is 
if we want sustainable learning, we have to look at the performance. We have to look at the larger issue. Yeah, brilliant. Because the thing is that's so confusing, Judy, is that uh, our stakeholders and, uh, and, uh, and employees themselves don't ask for their performance to be improved. They ask for training. Uh, so they want something delivered. And how many times have you gone back to an employee or a manager and said, oh, how are they doing? And they say, oh, the training didn't work. <laughs> and that's well, because it was learning focused and not performance focused there wasn't enough analysis done well, see, on what the person expected to do well see i guess my point is i would my training wouldn't look like their training at the ask yeah I, I i lie about whatever is training okay <laughs> so if they want training they got training the training can be a performance support tool maybe the training is getting two executives sit down and negotiate come to agreement and stop fighting in front of their people maybe you know it's so I'm not I'm not so bent on what purity about what training is. OK, mm. my goal is it, it really is performance. I'm sorry. Yeah. And, and if yeah. They, but I don't do language lessons with my client either. I don't say, well, I want people to pray. I said, you know, I said, well, of course, if you, you want them to be able to do the job properly and you want this and because then you have fewer customer complaints. So the real goal here is customer complaints going down, right? Oh, or real goal here is the time to close the sales too long. You want to shorten that. Or the real goal is to get the outside auditors to not chew us up, right? So, and training is going to be part of that. Not, I didn't say the solution. You know, I'm already changing my words. So training is going to be part of that, right? So there's some subtle things that you can do to do this. And, and, and there's other parts, of course, like agreement on direction, clear feedback, adequate support tools. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, uh, I think, you know, just to, just to say, I think you may have said, oh, my goodness, there, uh, Judy, see what uh, Liz has come in. And just before we wrap up, I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll just read what uh, Liz has said. I think it's also a matter of what L&D asks from the organization and how. And if there's a lot of solution focus in the conversation, then we're always going to deliver training. If there's a lot of problem focus and a lot of why, then it's likely that training might not even come up as a solution. But who's accountable to follow up when training isn't the solution? AKA L and D's work is seemingly done or not needed. And I suppose that's what this series is all about. Isn't it, isn't it guy that, uh, that if we accept that our role is in delivering training, then we might not see that improvement, uh, the, the performance, uh, it falls under that remit, but if we uh, conduct our own pivot and that begins as, as you've been stating, Judy, and, and all of our guests, um, uh, so far have, uh, if that, uh, if you engage in a different conversation at the outset, the whole thing, um, uh, continues in a in a very different fashion, and as uh, to to paraphrase what you've been saying uh, today, Judy, you might not even recognise it as training, but when your client gets what they needed rather than what they asked for, then we're we're all better and richer all round for it because we can demonstrate that value uh, that's so difficult um, for us to gain um, if uh, if we're not able to 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 uh, demonstrate our ROI. Um, but we have come to the end of, uh, of our session today. And Judy, thank you very much. Uh, it's been uh, hugely insightful. And we can tell from the engagement that, uh, that, that it's really resonated with, um, uh, with the folks who have joined us today. And just to remind you um, that, uh, that you will be receiving a, a copy of this recording. And everybody who has registered uh, for today's session will receive uh, a copy of the recording very shortly. So again, uh, in the, it's the, the season of goodwill. So please do share that with uh, with peers, colleagues, friends and family. Uh, I'm sure that they will. Uh, they'll be very grateful. Uh, we only have one more of these uh, these um, episodes um, in this series coming up, and that's in two weeks uh, where you can uh, you could you'll see Judy again, as well as um, the, the guests that we've had on the previous three episodes. But uh, um, uh, that session will be over to you. It's a panel discussion. And I must tell you that. Uh, and I'm sure you'll back me up here, Guy, that the panel discussion last year was amazing, wasn't it? It was so rich. And it may, it'll be made all the more better by the questions that our audience shares with us and we can pass on to our panel and make sure that we're answering questions that are relevant to the needs of our audience. 
Wonderful. So, uh, so thank you again for joining us, and thank you again, Judy, for uh, for your time and your insights today. It's been hugely valuable. It was a pleasure being here. Thank you, everyone.